All right, everyone, the cat is currently taking a nap right behind me, so you might hear a little bit of uh, snoring. Hopefully that won't interrupt the video too much here. It is pretty cute, though, you got to admit. Uh, we got to talk about occult synchronicity again because uh, we've got sort of uh, several separate stages of synchronicity have happened in the general lexicon of the online environment over the last few years. First, it was The Man in Grey, which mentions like being Legion and Anonymous and stuff. It's a song by Rational Youth from the 80s, the Canadian band. It's sort of like uh, maybe the better version of Duran Duran or something like that. <clears throat> then we have, of course, uh, everybody remembers uh, Pepe and Keck sort of looking at the frog hieroglyphs and weird stuff like that. It looks sort of like a dude seated at the computer with like DNA coming out or something. And then everyone remembers Chatelet. Um, that needs basically no further explanation. It's already been run into the ground. Uh, and now we have Baron Trump's marvelous underground journey. Now, when I first saw when I first saw this posted about, I assumed it was some sort of elaborate hoax, like someone slapped together uh, a PDF file. They like yellowed some paper and drew it up themselves to make it look like it was synchronicity. But no, it's it's actually a real book. Like it's been available for a number of years on Amazon uh, in several editions. And if you look at the PDF, you, it's, if you know anything about the sort of art used in like the, the youth fiction of the era, it is, uh, it's real. So here we have, believe it or not, a book from the end of the 1800s. We're talking, we're not even in the 20th century yet. It's from, you know, it's closer to the uh, Civil War than to World War II, of all things. And it's talking about little Baron Trump, this this boy and his various adventures with his dog named Bulger. Some people are making a patent reference out of that. Um, and uh, it's all very, very strange because if you look through it, it's talking about uh, one of his other, Ingersoll's other works is talking about like riotous sort of political situations, like the president being like, uh, you know, doing all sorts of weird things and like uproar within the republic and they i guess they install someone as emperor after a while so people are making you know a thousand the number of coincidental comparisons with the current situation we're in now politically with these works is so vast it boggles the mind it's it's more synchronicity than we got with chatelet uh and that's a lot of synchronicity too you know you got trips as far as the runtime you got ass art pepe and all all of this weird stuff. You know, you've even got a magical frog as the uh, the cover of the actual uh, record itself. Apparently, the dude uh, is still alive. Like, the live version of Chatelet is uploaded by the dude who's actually singing it there. Like, he's, he's alive. He's apparently aware of his new stardom. I'm sure he's thrilled about it. He's like, maybe we should do a re-release and make it even more occult in nature, because I'm sure that'll be flying off the shelves like hotcakes. He's probably like, whoa, you know, I did this in the middle of the 80s. Everyone loves it again. You know, <laughs> praise the Lord or something like that. Mm. It's great. But I was just skimming through this book. Some people have highlighted certain passages that have definite occult overtones. We're talking about uh, sort of a fantasy work. Uh, we're talking about something that is definitely occult in nature. To the point at which actually... Uh, just based on the short amount that I read, I would class it maybe with something like the Edadorfa, uh, or, or even the Antediluvian World, sort of this fantastical voyage sort of general thing um, that you find around that period. It's actually, uh, for the period, that would be fairly standard uh, in that style of literature. And you're talking like, you know, Gulliver's Travels, sort of weird stuff, uh, actually, uh, in general, sort of young adult, uh, adults, you know, you'd read it and it'd be fun to read as an entertainment piece, but it's like a uh, real The Power of the Coming Race that I just got done with. Now, it's basically the same style of thing. It influences things. Uh, look at the number of connections here to like, uh, it's, it's openly talking about Trump, specifically little Baron Trump. Uh, what's Trump's, you know, youngest son's name? And all of his weird adventures with his dog and stuff. Somebody was pointing out Mike Pence has a dog that looks exactly like that. And they thought that was freaky. Uh, when this sort of thing happens, here's the thing. You have to look at connections between different things in order to practice the occult. You have to look at synchronicity. Or you can say concordance or whatever term you'd like to use uh, for it. When two things overlap, especially over a span of time in different fields. Here you've got a fictional work. It's written for like young adults, little kids and stuff. And it's mentioning a bunch of things that have 
modern relevance within a fairly short span of modern time. Uh, has nothing to do with the same genre of awareness because, of course, we're talking about a modern social and political situation that couldn't have been directly foreseen by someone living at the end of the 19th century. It's impossible. It's like Chatelet. It's like The Man in Grey or any of these other things, sometimes decades or even a century in this case removed from what's being spoken of essentially. And you've got this occult overlap, and that's really the way in which memetics operates on that level. The other part of memetics is strictly propaganda. It's also strictly secular. I am of the belief, though, if, if let's assume something for a minute here and go into the fringe of uh, pseudoscience. Let's, just, let's assume that the increasingly popular idea that we're in some sort of uh, computer or matrix, as it were, uh, let's assume that that's true. Wouldn't you occasionally expect to get a little bit of a glitch going on? where things, uh, you know, overlap where they may not uh, be supposed to overlap or something like that. I think it's uh, observing that, observing cause and effect, and observing overlap, and observing what we would term now in the occult sense synchronicity, is how human culture actually began in the first place, of course, again, uh, Erg hits an animal with a rock, he notices certain shapes of rocks are more uh, appropriate for bashing animals with the first uh, tool working begins. Erg realizes that leaving certain types of rocks next to the fire makes a weird metallic substance emerge. Copper is soon smelted and worked with. And that's ba or, or clay or anything like that. It's basically the way it works. Erg realized that uh, fire comes from lightning and lightning looked a little bit like the sparks that happen when Erg bashes these two uh, flaky rocks together, so Erg decided to uh, experiment on a smaller scale. That's essentially, I mean, to a person living at the time, it wouldn't have made any sense. It's just a dim connection between two things that seem similar. That's what we have. It drives human progress. It's like Vriel or the Edda Dorfo or Tales of Atlantis or something. It doesn't have to be explicitly real. It still informs uh, humanity all the way through. If we look at the World War II period, or even before that in the interwar period in Europe, we're looking at occult movements that overlap directly with social and political movements that drove the rise of fringe groups within Europe. All atomic era human history is derived from that period of time, from the jet engine on through. Here's the thing, though. That was driven by occultism that was based on this kind of sci-fi literature explicitly this sort of work in connection this uh real the power of the coming race the antediluvian world tomaso city of the sun all of these texts from the renaissance up through the 1800s that were basically just entertain throwaway entertainment for the most part directly informed people like blavatsky who took hold of those works and then promulgated them uh, in the very end of the 1800s through the Victorian era at large and into the Edwardian era, uh, sort of throughout the world. For about half a century, it informed all eras of occultism. And all of the New Age occultism you see now, the resurgence of neo-paganism is derived from the same source, the uh, arrival of Wicca in the world at large, certainly certain movements within Christendom, within the more mystic circles of a uh, of uh, uh, devil worship in the more literal sense. It all comes from the same source. It's all coming from a bunch of sci-fi and fantasy. Here's the principle. Somebody lays something forth in sci-fi and fantasy. It seems really, really cool. It seems like something to be emulated. People who engineer society attempt to do so, sometimes to success. Sometimes, of course, it falls flat. Uh, the, the sort of artistic styles that were in vogue in the early 20th century, we're talking like the Art Nouveau through Art Deco movements, are derived from that same sort of explicit sense of grandeur that you would get from the antediluvian world, sort of the, the steampunk look that people now, they go out and they drink a little bit of absinthe in a field somewhere and listen to a Rasputina or something like that. It's the same thing. Every element of human culture is derived not from an, uh, the observation of objective reality, but from the observation from a perceptive standpoint uh, of what can be of connections between different things. That's where human collective consciousness comes from. Uh, it doesn't come from objective reality. Science doesn't even necessarily apply itself, <clears throat> I'll say this, to objective reality, generally speaking. There are some things that we can say are objective. We can say the chromosomes control gender. We can observe it directly. A lot of scientific thought, though, is purely theoretical. 
it fits. It's a hypothesis uh, that is concluded to best fit observable experimental reality uh, generally. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. Sometimes what's thought to be true a century later is considered total nonsense. Like the idea that the atom is, is irreducible, of course, we now know it's totally fake. We now know, it, we know there are neutrons and all of these other things that they didn't know about 100 years ago. Uh, we know that there are all sorts of weird particles that we didn't even account for. <laughs> it's a totally different reality we live in. Ever, ever remember, uh, man couldn't uh, step foot on the moon because it was impossible. You'd like, you'd get fried by uh, radiation, or you would crash. You couldn't get enough propulsion, or you'd get there and you'd find it was made out of cheese or something like that. People actually, a hundred years ago, would have cons uh, assumed that that was true. That was their reality. Reality is totally different now. Look how malleable it is. And people are going to say that, oh, there can't be such a thing as the occult. There can't be synchronicity. Yeah, if we're living in a matrix, there can be anything under the sun. You probably could make a real unicorn. You probably could make a dragon or something. There's no limitation to what we can do because it's a fucking AI program or something like that. Just operate from that assumption and anything becomes possible. Of course, reality is a bit more mundane than that. But then you get these little glitches that occur and a lot of people would like to ignore them they don't want to think about it too much it challenges their perception of mundane reality some secularists they don't want to think about synchronicity because it seems too real uh, they would rather think of uh, something more fantastic and out there like tales of dragons or uh, or witches and black cats turning people into toads because then they can easily categorize it as fiction they can easily say it is false, it's never observable, it makes no sense. Historically speaking, it wasn't even like dogmatic or anything. It was just weird medieval opinion. But then they look at something like this and they say, well, it's plausible, it fits uh, at least loosely with what I would expect from a real situation. And you got a book over a hundred years ago talking about the Trumps and, and all of this other stuff and there seem to be uh, dozens of coincidental <laughs> coincidental similarities between actual reality and this book that comes so far earlier that Donald Trump wasn't even alive at the time. He wouldn't be born for, what, 30, 40 more years. Uh, and then they see that, and it, it perturbs them a little bit. It, 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 uh, it bothers them, I think, because they want to see reality as controlled and mundane and very stagnant, things like that. And then they find out it uh, may not actually be the case. There may be a little bit of something to the occult that they don't want to admit actually is there. But if you'd like to, if you believe in the basic principle, but you don't believe in like the spiritual hoodoo side, uh, you can always chalk it up to we're in a matrix or something like that. That's perfectly acceptable. Or you can uh, just say it's all coincidence. It's just a bundle of coincidences in one work that happened to exist. Uh, for coincidental reasons because of mathematical probabilities involved. Yeah, that's fine, too. It's like I don't ask others to believe uh, specifically in any tenet of the occult. But I think uh, there's something to synchronicity here. I think it's got a few people a little bit freaked out. That's about all. Peace out.